Good afternoon, everybody. That woke you up, didn't it? Um, first of all, thank you to the organisers, Gov, today, and thank you to Luminex. This is uh, the masterclass around innovative molecular diagnostics, so if you're in the wrong one, you can leave now. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a double act. It's a bit like Laura and the Hardy. Uh, which one's Laura and which one's Hardy? I'll allow you to, to ask. Um, I'm going to introduce it. My name is Jim Anson. I'm the medical director of Liverpool Clinical Laboratories, which is a joint venture between Aintree and the Royal Liverpool Hospital. And we've had some experience over the last few years of looking at uh, innovative uh, gastrointestinal diagnostics. Um, I'm going to give you a brief introduction and then hand over to David Knight, who's the UK business manager for Luminex, and then I'll come back on and tell you a little bit about what's been happening in Liverpool. And then we'll have a, a question and answer session right at the end. So let me just take you back a little bit, and I thought it would be quite interesting just to tell you what I think is happening in the minds of the uh, government a couple of miles down the river. We know that over the next 30 years there's a perfect storm brewing, and I know we've heard the perfect storm today around antimicrobial resistance, but there's actually a bigger perfect storm, if that's such a big thing, going on. We know that there's a problem with care of the elderly. The government want them to be socially engaged, dense social networks. We know that chronic disease management, including cancer, which is now part of chronic disease, uh, and mental health and care support is going to be a major problem with diabetes and obesity. We know that we're going to have increased specialist surgical and therapeutic interventions. We know there's new science coming in terms of um, uh, pharmacotherapeutics, genetics, molecular imaging and diagnostics. And there's new technologies coming along which allow flexible platforms which underpin some of these things. And you're well aware that there's been a number of reports which are, uh, I think, all coming to fruition now in terms of the government. There's the Bell Report, which is the UK Science PLC, but there's also the Greenaway Report uh, around medical education. There's also uh, the Willits Report and the Dilmot Report around social care. And all these are coming together to make the government think about how we actually provide health and social care for the next 30 years. The Bell Report was put together, uh, and you'll see why I think it's important in a minute, uh, was put together a few years ago by Sir John Bell, um, when the government were realising that actually we don't have a manufacturing base, we have a finance base, but actually what else could we sell? Or perhaps we could sell brains, and actually we do some good biomedical research as well as, well as other research within the UK. And so Bell put together uh, a number of uh, recommendations, and these are just the highlights of them which actually we could sell. So genetic profiling and therapeutic targeting, so the whole issue around cancer stratified medicine and personalized medicine, proton beam therapy, high-speed informatics, which again is crucially important as we move into the genomic and proteomic era, stem cell-based research, and regeneration and bioengineering. But this comes, as we all know, in terms of times of fiscal constraints, so the table at the top there uh, tries to show you, I think, that the big depressions and recessions that we've had over the years have actually been relatively small compared with the banking bust of 2008, which is project projected to actually have implications for the next 10 years. And we you know people talk about the depression of the 30s, but actually that's only what went on for 50 months. So the, we know there's going to be a tight fiscal regime. Real incomes are down, the size of the state's down. And if those of you who read the Times will know that there's a two billion black hole in the NHS coffers for 2015, 2016. So where does that leave pathology? Well, pathology is big business. Um, these are just uh, 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 indicative numbers. So 500 million biochemistry tests per annum, 13 million histopathology slides per annum. And actually that's a cost of about 2.5 billion and the whole NHS England budget for 2013-14 was actually 95 million, so it's about 3%. And we know that demand is growing year on year. So I think pathology generally is at a crossroads here. We, we all know, and I know it's a mixed audience, but we know that pathology is involved with 70 to 80% of all healthcare decisions. Some of that's diagnosis, some of it's treatment, some of it's prognosis, some of it's monitoring. We know there's new technologies coming which actually have higher acquisition costs. So, for instance, whole genome sequencing, which is a little bit of a misnomer because actually it's not whole genome, it's partial genome sequencing, point-of-care diagnostics, proteomics. 
We know that there's the fiscal constraints, which we've talked about. We know there's the Carter reforms in terms of pathology modernization. We all have an ongoing CIP to meet. And we have a confusing NHS architecture with commissioning and the private sector. So really, we are at this crossroads, and that's where I think we need clinical leadership. So in that context, I think it's interesting to debate where innovative molecular diagnostics fit in. How do they help? Are they cost effective across the health economy? Or are they just a complete and utter waste of time? So what we're going to discuss is a, a, an example of an innovative multiplex PCR. And, and again, I'm aware that some of you probably aren't uh, clinicians, uh, aren't people who work in laboratories. So I'm going to invite David Knight to, from Luminex to just give you a little insight as to what Luminex uh, technology is and what it can do. And then I'll come back and tell you a little bit about the experience we've had in Liverpool. Thank you, Jim. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Knight. I'm the commercial lead for Luminex here in the UK. So I'm going to deliver a very short presentation, probably between five and ten minutes. I want to give you a flavor of some of the diagnostic assays that we produce and some of the clinical benefits, some of the lab benefits. I'm then going to hand back to Jim and he'll tell you a little bit about his experience in Liverpool using this kind of technology. So to begin with, uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about a molecular assay that we produce called gastrointestinal pathogen panel, so GPP for short. And really from one sample and one laboratory test, we provide 15 results simultaneously. So we're talking about a panel that includes bacteria, that includes viruses, and includes parasites also. So it's a 21-plex molecular assay. The reason we can do this is because of the kind of technology that we use, and we use microspheres, and we call this XMAP technology. And what it means in terms of multiplexing is we can produce up to 500 different biological agents simultaneously using this kind of bead-based technology. And what it allows us to do is to tag either antibodies, uh, pieces of DNA, peptides, ligands, receptors, almost anything we want onto these beads to allow you to uh, assay and to capture the bugs that you're interested in. So the first question is usually, does it work? Well, actually, no, the first question is, how much is it usually in the NHS? Second question is then, does it work? So just some data here, we have more than 20,000 peer-reviewed publications using Luminex technology. So I think we've got a good heritage and a good pedigree to work from. Just looking at GPP on its own, I've picked out a couple of references from 2012-13. So again, all of these are available on our website. So you can see that the ASCII does what it said it does. If we think about current algorithms in the laboratory today, if you've got a patient who presents with diarrhea, you'll probably send a stool sample to the laboratory. It will then go through a lot of different processes within the lab. Each of the different bacteria will probably have a different selective agar type medium to, to grow the bacteria. There may be some enzyme immunoassay, GDH for example, for uh, C. diff testing and, and toxin EIA. There may be some PCR as well. So what we can do with our technology is to take one stool sample, send it to the lab. Within five to six hours, you've got those 15 pathogens that it really streamlines the process within the lab. What it also does is give you, the clinicians, the results very quickly, which allows you then to be empowered to make the appropriate decisions for your patient management. And one of the things it does do is really shortens hospital stay in terms of isolation. One of the key things with the ASI is, if you get a negative result, you've got a very, very high negative predictor value. That means if you've got a patient sitting in isolation, you can pretty much safely take that patient out and make sure you have the appropriate people isolated, thus giving you the best chance of preventing any kind of outbreaks before they happen. So, so Jim is gonna share some information with you from Liverpool. I'm gonna give you some background from some other studies that we did. So very early on in London, we took a cohort of 450 samples. We run it using the conventional methodologies you can see on the left-hand side, and you can see the percentage positives that they achieved with traditional methodology. They ran the exact same samples with GPP, and you can see that they detected a lot more using GPP by screening. So what they concluded was actually using their current methodologies, they're missing at least 70% of the pathogens in the stool samples coming through the lab. One of the things that was also very important was they found that 12% of the samples had co-infection. 
I think a lot of times in the lab we find something and we're quite happy to leave it there. We don't think about co-infections and perhaps some of the treatments that, that, that may impact. So that's something that's really quite important. Excellent sensitivity and specificity, and I mentioned before the very, very high negative predictor value that allows you to de-isolate people from isolation quite quickly. I don't expect you to read this slide, but really what they did as part of the second study in London was to look at a, a period over the winter uh, and just look at uh, the impact on uh, using this kind of technology. So in this particular hospital, they had a triage system and they would isolate based on clinical symptoms. And what they found was actually 12 to 14 percent of what they thought were uh, low risk did in fact have a pathogen that could go on to cause an outbreak. On the flip side of that, they found 64 percent of the people that they had isolated really didn't have any detectable pathogen. So these are the people that they could realistically de-escalate and get them out of isolation. One of the last uh, parts of this study was, uh, again, a further study to look at the healthcare economic side of things. And this was an eight month study with over 2000 samples. And again, you'll see this on the website, but over on the right hand side, you can see that by using the negative predictor value, they could have saved 3,100 isolation bed days over that eight month period. So really quite powerful statistics. So just to kind of complete the picture with Luminex, we have multiplexing for lots of different applications. We have respiratory virus. We can use multiplexing for personalized medicine. We can use it for cystic fibrosis as well. So a lot of uh, applications that we have. We don't just have multiplexing. We also do real-time PCR, and we're about to launch this system into the marketplace this year. And we're looking at a system that is sample to answer in under two hours. So all of the extraction, the amplification, and detection is carried out in a self-contained disposable cartridge. So we're launching with five different assays. Some of those will be a multiplex using flu A, B, RSV. We're gonna have C. diff, and we're gonna have norovirus as well. So again, I just challenge you, what would you do differently if you had same day result for 15 of the most common causes of infectious diarrhea? So I'm gonna hand back to Jim now. He's gonna give you some examples of the current situation in Liverpool and some of their experiences. Thank you, David. So, I couldn't think of anything else but Liverpool diarrhea and outbreak, and you'll see why when I, when I go through it. So, I was putting these slides together and I uh, thought I'd just show you some nice pictures of Liverpool after lunch. So we do have some nice buildings in Liverpool, and in fact, as we sit here in London, did, did you actually know that we actually, in Liverpool, have the most grade two listed buildings out of any city outside London? Uh, and there's two of them in terms of the Catholic Cathedral and the Anglican Cathedral. And they always look better of a night when they're lit up, don't they? It's like they're airbrushed. St. George's Hall on the top there, which is uh, Prince Charles's favourite building in the UK, and the uh, ubiquitous Albert Dock. Unfortunately, we have some lovely buildings as well. This is the Royal Liverpool, uh, where I work. A uh, big inner city teaching hospital, which is falling apart at the moment in terms of the concrete decay. And so hopefully by 2017, we'll have a, a brand new spanking PFI build, which is this is artist impression of. Um, don't hold your breath, 2017, they say. So what I'm going to show you really is a, is a bit of a magical mystery tour of a number of things which we've been doing over the last couple of years uh, and a study which uh, we've just embarked upon with Preston and Manchester and Luminex looking at how innovative molecular diagnostics can help control and ascertain community diarrhea outbreaks. And I think that's a paradigm for how we move for, further forward with syndromic management. So let's just have a little bit of the context. So uh, we know, and all those of you who know about these things will know that infectious diarrhea, the etiology is variable. It can be bacterial, it can be viruses, it can be parasites. And although there are some paradigms and some algorithms uh, in terms of scoring systems, they're not particularly well validated and they're not particularly well used. We know from a study which I will talk a bit about in a minute called IID, which is Intestinal Infectious Diseases 2 study. There was a one study in 2000. Sarah O'Brien published in 2011. And we know that 25% of the population have an episode of infectious intestinal disease annually. Two thirds of that is viral and a third of it is bacterial. But it is actually quite difficult to differentiate clinically. 
And also, we know that there's poor ascertainment of, co of the causes, and the cause is unidentified in 80% of cases. And some of the reasons for that will, will come clear in a minute. And that can lead to clinical confusion. So when the clinician or the GP sends a stool to the laboratory, they're not necessarily asking, is this salmonella, is this norovirus, is this shigella? Sometimes they are. But actually, what they actually want is they're saying, this patient's got diarrhea, tell me the cause of it. And we know the burden of disease in the community uh, is uh, this onion skin. So we obviously have national surveillance data, but actually that's a small part in terms of those that may have organisms identified. Even then, some aren't, stool samples aren't taken. Only some present to the GP. And actually, most people are just ill in the community. And actually, we've got no idea of whether it's an etiological agent causing it or what the issues are. The IID1 study, which was in 2000, showed that there was about 9 million cases annually, which is about one in five of the population, and, and had a cost associated with about 0.75 billion. Uh, which you can see a breakdown there. However, the IAD2 study shows that actually that burden is probably bigger. And this tries to show you the, the ratio of uh, reported to national surveillance, presenting to a general practice, and disease in the community. And if you can see uh, from the bottom there, it's about 150 uh, times greater in the community as is reported to national surveillance, which isn't surprising, but there's a huge burden out there. And in ID2 ID uh, and ID1, there was a difference in terms of the agents uh, that were identified, partly because of the methods did change. But I think, interestingly, what we saw is that there's a massive rise in sapovirus. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of it, sapovirus is an emerging pathogen causing diarrhea in the community, and also Campylobacter, with a smattering of other things there, and, of course, norovirus as a, as a, big, uh, as a big blip. So what, people will say? Well, I think actually if you look at diarrheal disease in general, you look at it on a global uh, uh, scale, we know that there's 2 billion cases of infectious diarrhea each year and about 1.8 million deaths. But even within Europe, there's about 200,000 cases and 1,000 deaths. And data from the IID2 study suggests that there's actually 17 million cases of gastrointestinal infectious disease in the UK with about 1 million GP consultations. So that takes a, a burden from into the healthcare service. It has major disruption to hospitals with ward closures. It leads to bled, bled, yeah, bed blocking and loss of tariff. And it has a huge socioeconomic impact with the loss of about 11 million working days uh, and school days. And it's estimated that that has a financial impact of about 1.5 billion. Now, some of that is opportunity cost. It's not real cost. But I think when we're talking about a £2 billion shortfall within the NHS budget for 2015-2016, you can see that there is a real impact in terms of the financial. Now, part of the problem with uh, the UK at the moment and, and elsewhere is that the current diagnostic strategy is fractured. Uh, I, I don't know who here has runs laboratories, but... Often the diagnostics are done in different parts of the laboratory. Some will be done in virology by different methodologies. Some will be done in parasitology. Some will be done in bacteria. And it's inconsistent. So you know, we're all aware the PHE are bringing out standard microbiological investigations, but it's inconsistent across the UK. It's non-standardized. People will look for different things depending upon clinical details or how they feel. And it depends upon demographics and stool type. And it's largely labor intensive. And certainly within our laboratory, uh, we use five, at least five different methods, bacterial cultural, culture, virus PCR, two microscopy methods, uh, and a, an EIA for CDT. And David's already shown you this, but this is a cartoon which basically tries to hammer that home in that it's a fractured, inconsistent, labor-intensive, uh, uh, insensitive way of doing things. So... A few years ago, we got interested in looking at a different way of uh, examining stools for pathogens, and we picked up Luminex GPP, and we thought, well, we'll have a look at it, and we did. So I'm not going to go through the laboratory aspects. That's not what we're here to do, but we looked at the analytical sensitivity and specificity. We did some retrospective testing, and we did some prospective testing. 
And again, I'm not going to go into this in any great detail, but this is the methodology that we utilize. So we use bead beating for the, get the, virus, um, for the parasites. We used an automated extraction platform, the Choir Symphony, um, and we, uh, we hybridized. Now, this can all be automated, and I think one of the things which we can talk about later on is the scalability of this. So obviously, if this is for an individual patient, that's easy if it's one specimen, but if you're doing 100 specimens a day, can you scale it? And you can scale it up, you can automate it, and you can uh, have the uh, automated PCR setup. So, again, I'm not going to talk in great detail about the data. Um, all, all I want to say is, just to reiterate the London data, is that we saw the positivity rate increase from 16% to 30%, and 30% seems to be the, the number in the literature that's the magic number. We saw mixed infections in about 12%, uh, and again, there's a debate as to what that actually does mean. Uh, and not unsurprisingly, 51% of the additional pathogens detected by GPP had not been tested for by current laboratory methodologies. So we were happy that it worked, as it said on the tin. We were happy that we understood a little bit about the routine use of it. But what we wanted to know is how it would impact upon laboratory uh, flow and laboratory activity. So. We had a positive evaluation. We had a stakeholder meeting with infectious diseases, public health, et cetera, et cetera, infection control. And largely that was very positive with the go ahead to let's have a look further. So we, in, we employed an independent company from Texas called Nexus, who came over and did a time and motion study, if excuse the pun. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into any great details, but this, I'm not expecting you to read this. On the, on the left, no, your right hand side, uh, is, the, is our current flow in the laboratory. So each way that we could manage a, a positive culture or a positive test was actually, there was 17 pathways. And with GPP, we actually uh, managed to uh, streamline that to five pathways. And we also looked at the uh, turnaround time. So in purple is a negative result, in, in red is the positive result. And as you can see from the top, it can take up to four, three or four days to get a positive result through. Whereas with Illuminex uh, GPP, in day one, we get all the results through. But we also wanted to go a little bit further. We wanted to actually understand the costs associated with this. So we did something uh, that the uh, police do at the moment and the Marines in, in, in the States do. We used activity-based costings, um, and this is, was popular in the 1980s as an accounting methodology, and it basically tries to look at the consumption of all resources, so it, ha it's, it uh, assigns overhead costs into those direct costs. And we did it for everything. We did it right the way through, everything we did. And again, I'm not going to go into this in any great detail, but these are the, uh, the organisms that we, we culture for, or we uh, try to isolate, or we do PCR for. The ones in yellow are things that are not in the GPP assay at the moment. And we looked at the delta for the labor and the delta for the turnaround time and the delta for the cost, i.e. the change that would have been in place. And I'm not going to go through the actual savings for you, uh, for each individual one, but in our hands, actually, to implement GPP, even though the acquisition costs were more expensive, in terms of resource and biomedical science input, we actually saved £24,000. So we had a test which we were happy with. We thought in our hands we could make a business case. So what? Well, we all know that we all get caught up in the NHS pathology reforms. There was a Carter report in 2006 uh, where we knew we had to take some waste and inefficiencies out of the system. We have problems with commissioning of pathology service, and we all have a cost improvement program of about 45% each year, year on year recurrent. And I'll let you read that. I think this is how we sometimes feel within the NHS at the moment. Um, and this was uh, Gaius Petronius Arbiter in 66 AD, and I don't think things have changed very much since then. And I think the, the issue for us at the moment and the challenge is how we deal with the molecularization of infection diagnostics. So there are more, there are more and more platforms out there which uh, can give an answer uh, in certain situations, maybe even actually out in the community in the GP practice. 
but how do we actually try to make a decision about how we implement this? So I think one of the challenges for us is that we have, I think, a, uh, a slash and burn versus silo budgeting uh, culture within the NHS. Uh, so here we have the pathology silo and my budget, we have a pharmacy silo for drugs, and we have a bed holding silo, and there the twain shall meet. And I think the challenge for us all really is to show uh, in an efficient way that by putting some resource into pathology and molecular diagnostics up front, you can actually take money further down the line out of another silo. And I think it's getting directors of finance and CCGs to understand that. And so consequently, by putting in something uh, on, on the left-hand side, you actually get better bed utilization, better use of isolation facilities, more tariff and targeted therapy. And actually the costs for the health economy are down. So what next? Well, what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at a, a one health paradigm for detecting and investigating clusters and outbreaks of diarrhea and vomiting in the community. And this was really a, a, an approach to population sampling. It was an approach to cluster detection. We wanted to use modern microbiological methods and we wanted to integrate it with veterinary surveillance systems. And we wanted to really use it as a paradigm for, for how we could move further forward with syndromic algorithms in the future. And so Outbreak was, uh, was launched, uh, and it's a, a collaborative between Manchester, Preston, and Liverpool, uh, with funding from the Wellcome Trust and the uh, Food Standards Agency. So if you think about, in the community, how we identify outbreaks at the moment, you have poor old little Lucy who's vomiting or not very well, who may phone the GP, um, and the GP, or they may go to the GP. The GP may or may not send a stool. Uh, that comes to the laboratories, but as we've seen before with the inconsistent and fractured ways that we do things, that might be two to three days before a result comes back. That result may well then go to Public Health England or may go to reference facilities. And that can then take five, week, five days to nine weeks before the actual full result comes back. What are we proposing in this study? We're actually proposing that uh, poor old Lucy is, is ill. They phone NHS Direct. Now, this is where we have fallen foul because NHS Direct, as you know, has been disbanded. Um, so we're just regrouping about how we actually do that. But what we actually want to do is get the stool directly and put it through Luminex GPP. NHS Direct or the GP Sentinel services, which we probably will utilize in the future, will actually also have real-time updating. The result will go back to the GP within a day. It'll all go back to uh, the information system and the surveillance system within the day. We will do some whole genome sequencing for pathogen discovery, but also for, um, for looking at the uh, the way that organisms are moving through the health community. We've linked it in with SARSVET, so a, a sub animal surveillance, so it's a one health approach to these things. And all that data will be utilized as a mathematical model, which will be available for public health physicians to be able to look in real time with maps associated with their areas, exactly what is happening within 24 hours of somebody having a diarrheal or, or a vomiting episode. So this will give public health physicians a real grip on whether there are outbreaks occurring, what is causing that outbreak, etc., and allow public health intervention. So what are we using for that? Well, we're using something that's already in going. It's called EGIS, which is Ascertainment and Enhancement of Gastrointestinal Surveillance and Statistics. This was something that was uh, put in by Peter Diggle from Lancaster uh, probably 10 years ago now, utilizing Southampton HPA at the time as the pilot site. We're utilizing molecular diagnostics, and in this situation, we, we've gone for Luminex XTAG GPP, as you've heard, because it has the, the greatest coverage of all of the panels available. We're going to utilize microbial genomics. We're linking in with, the, with SAVSNET, which is based in Liverpool, and we're also looking at livestock surveillance data. 
So it is truly a one health approach for looking at the way that gastrointestinal disease presents in the UK. So these are the people who are involved. Uh, it's multifaceted, PHE in Manchester, Lancashire Teaching Hospitals, the Royal Liverpool Hospital, uh, Public Health England, Bangor in terms of the health e economics, uh, South Ness as we talked about, Cumbria and Lancashire, NHS Direct, where they were involved, they're not now, uh, and obviously Luminex as our partners in terms of the uh, Luminex GPP assay. So we're going to use multiplex PCR to detect and identify multiple pathogens, and we're going to employ microbial genomics in a targeted fashion. So some of it will be around pathogen discovery for negative stool sam samples. Some of it will be for positive stool samples for typing and monitoring of the evolution of pathogens. And that will hopefully be an iterative approach in terms of designing rapid diagnostic tests for new pathogens. So we think over a three-year or an 18-month no, two-year period, there will be 100,000 calls to NHS Direct for diarrhoea. About 10% of people will probably take part. It's about 10,000 people. And we know the, the dropout rate from IID2. So we're thinking we'll probably get about 6,000 fecal specimens. And looking at the data, we think about 4,800 of those will be unlinked, and about 1,200 will be in clusters. So for the known pathogens, uh, which will be about 30%, as we've said before, uh, we're, we will in, enrich, extract RNA and DNA. Um, and if there are issues associated with severity, like there was in terms of the E. coli 104 outbreak in, the, in Germany, we'll use iron torrent for rapid turnaround and sequencing. If not, we're going to use HiSeq to actually sequence them on a routine basis. Perhaps interestingly, I think also part of the project will be looking at putative pathogen discovery, um, and we've got uh, funding for about 100 microbiomes and, uh, uh, and viromes in terms of looking at metagenomics, and again, some of that will be done by HiSeq and some of it will be done by Ion Torrent, and that will look for possible new potential pathogens in those clusters, which again feed that iterative cycle in terms of being able to diagnose and put into syndromic panels in the future those pathogens which are coming through. So the reason why I think it's important is because uh, it's a pathfinder project with wider applications. Uh, we have clinical syndromes, syndromic management of respiratory disease and uh, CNS disease. We'll be able to look at incorporating in a modular fashion new technologies as they come on stream. I think it will be scalable in terms of looking at local issues, but also regional and national um, applications and rollout. And I think it's a paradigm for how we manage community and hospital, and perhaps that artificial barrier that we have at the moment between the two uh, primary care and secondary care, and that needs to be broken down, and we need to actually have a one health approach to trying to deal with this. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, these are the co-investigators. As you can see, it's a huge number of people involved. Um, and the funders are UK Food Standards Agency and the, and the Wellcome Trust. And I think with that, I'll finish. And if there's any questions, we'll try and answer them for you. So the question was, for those of you who didn't hear, will, will, will this give you uh, the sensitivity profile of the organisms? And the answer is no, um, it, it doesn't. So there still will be a need uh, from an epidemiological point of view in terms of um, culturing the positives. For instance, if you get a salmonella positive by signal, uh, by PCR, uh, I think most people would still want to culture it such that you can actually uh, type it, you can actually get the sensitivity profile, and the same for Campylobacter, etc. So it doesn't. Um, I think as things move further forward, perhaps with uh, metagenomics and understanding how we uh, look at whole genome sequencing and, and utilize it, that might come on stream a bit later on, but I don't think that's there at the moment. So laboratories who implement PCR testing of fecal pathogens will probably need to be able to isolate those organisms still. Okay. 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 Thank you.